All right, we're already on to employment. And employment is a smaller circle inside the larger circle of principal agency relationship. Because with employment, you are getting paid. And we talked last chapter about how the principal agency relationship, you don't have to get paid. Now here's the chapter objectives. Please remember that these PowerPoints are not meant to supplant your reading. So please read first. If you want to, look at the text-based PowerPoint and then listen to the audio because the audio points things out from the PowerPoint still further. So you've got your chapter, then you've got your focus in with the text-based PowerPoint, and then you get your even further focus in with the audio PowerPoint. All right. So we're going to do a ton of different information about employment today. Um, the different duties an employer has. We're going to talk a little bit about the Fair Labor Standards Act, some pensions, Family and Medical Leave Act, um, employment at will versus employment contracts, and California is pretty much an employment at will state. Workers' compensation, independent contractors versus employees, because that changes benefits and pay. And then also just a couple immigration laws regarding employment. Okay, so an employer employee relationship can be full time, part time. Independent contractors are not actually employees, and that's a common misconception. So we're going to talk about those in more detail in a little bit. And then internships, there's been a lot of really interesting case law about this that typically interns now, depending on how long they work and what they get out of it, they might have to be paid. So that's the black swan case we'll talk about a little bit more later. Okay, so all the duties of principals apply to employers, the things we talked about before. In addition, we've got minimum wage laws, overtime laws for some employees, uh, potential pensions, those aren't required for everybody, Family Medical Leave Act, Workers' Compensation, Occupational Safety, um, and Immigration, which comes into play with employees as well. Okay, so what's the fair Labor Standards Act? Okay, so I always screw this up, so if you can come up with a mnemonic to make you remember, that's great. Exempt employees do not get overtime. Non-exempt employees do get overtime. And there's questions about whether paralegals get overtime or not, and it really kind of depends on your duties. So this does typically apply to private employers. Um, if an employee is non-exempt, then they should be receiving time and a half for any hours worked over 40 hours in one week. And so one of the things that you really saw happening with the bad economy is you saw a lot of uh, employers, i.e. Target, firing full-time employees, rehiring people as part-time so they could get out of you know, a lot of benefits and trying to get out of overtime as well to some extent. Um, so why was the Fair Labor Standards Act originally implemented? There were too many kids under the age of 16 that were doing hard labor and they wanted to stop that. And they also wanted to make sure that kids typically had to be 18 or over to work in a hazardous environment. All right, minimum wage. So there's a federal one, but then the states can raise it up higher than that. And we have done that in the state of California. And servers, waitresses, or waiters get paid much less. There's different rules for them. And then they typically hopefully make it up in tips. Okay, employer employee benefit plans. Okay, so this will be separate 
from Social Security. Um, somebody might get a set amount each month in retirement. But what's more common now is a defined contribution plan. And there's no set amount that the employee will get. An employee typically has to help contribute to get that. All right, a qualified plan allows the employer to go ahead and get a tax break for offering it to the employee. So, for example, for you guys as paralegals, typically in most law offices, you're going to be offered a 401k plan. That stands for the IRS code section. And what it is, the employer, the law firm, gets a break tax-wise by offering you a 401k plan that you can contribute into, and the employer also typically matches somewhat. All right, the Family Medical Leave Act is good for you to know. You're eligible for 12 weeks unpaid leave, unpaid being the operative word, within 12 months. Um, sometimes you can get paid through state disability in the state of California for things like the birth of a child. Um, but typically it's unpaid leave 12 weeks up to a 12 month period and it can include adoption, taking care of sick family members, taking care of your own health problems. All right, so then we have the Nevada Department of Human Resources versus Hibbs case. And this also applies in the state of California. We have a very similar law here. And it was basically ruling that men have the same right as women to take off up to 12 weeks unpaid for the birth of a child. Okay. Employment at will is the law of the land in the state of California. Meaning that if you don't have an employment contract that you sign with the employer or even an employee handbook, then typically you can be fired for almost any reason other than some discriminatory reason like gender, sexual orientation, age discrimination. So in this case, the Wendland versus Beatrice Manor case, an employee ratted out the nursing home for abusing a patient and the play was fired well that was not allowed because she, that play was protected and whistleblowing against the employer for that basically crime all right employment agreements so most law firms don't have employment agreements still with their paralegals so you're going to be at will if you get an employment agreement, please read it. Um, perhaps even have an attorney that you know and trust review it with you. Because then that will be what controls. Okay, workers' compensation is huge in the state of California. We have a ton of it. We have a lot of workers and employers, unfortunately, don't give enough training to. And they get into a lot of workers' compensation accidents. If you're injured on the job, your employer typically has to pay for your medical coverage. The problem with this is that you typically don't get as much money as if you were able to get a civil court. It's an either or situation. It's workers' comp or civil litigation, and typically you don't get to choose. The benefit is that you would typically get paid faster, and your medical coverage would get paid quicker if it was workers' comp, but then you don't get as much money if you can go to civil litigation and sue in court. So there's toss-ups on either end. So what are things that are covered? Okay, it had to be within the scope, course and scope of the employment, basically, in order to be covered by workers' compensation. There was a contract. It didn't have to be oral. I mean, written. It could be oral. So anything saying that you're basically an employee for the employer. And the employer had to accomplish the way in which the employee um, did the work. So, for example, I'm an employee of Southwestern College, and the Southwestern College District does control the way in which I do my work. For instance, I have to be on Canvas now. I can't be on Blackboard. 
Um, so that is sufficient to have that employee-employer relationship for purposes of workers' compensation. And we already talked about the course and scope of employment, so it has to be part of normal job duties. So as long as I'm teaching at Southwestern College or anything related to teaching, and I was injured on the job, and they provided me with a workers' compensation stuff within the statutory time limit, then I would basically be required to go through workers' compensation. Now, let's say I decided that I wanted to run for political office, which I can't imagine myself wanting to do, but let's just say I did, and I started campaigning on campus, which I would never do, but let's say I did. Then that would not be covered because it's not under the course and scope of my employment. It's not related to my teaching per se, unless maybe I was running for like school board or something. All right, exceptions to workers' compensation. Okay, if someone's drunk on the job and they get injured as a result, that's not going to be covered. If somebody, if, an, if another employee at Southwestern College intentionally beat me up, that wouldn't be covered. I get to get a civil court. If somebody is driving to and from work and they're injured, that typically is not covered. Now, if somebody frolic and detours, like for instance, um, I had to go to a conference and I decided, which I would never do, but I decided to stop off at the local bar and drink a bunch, that would not be covered. But remember, I would never do that. Okay. Um, exclusive resume. So that's, this is what we were talking about with saying that it's an either or civil litigation or workers comp and you typically don't get to choose. Okay, what are the differences between employees and independent contractors? Because if someone's an independent contractor, they're probably not going to be under workers compensation. And the number one factor is does the employer have the ability to control how you do the work? So for me, going back to the Southwestern College example, I'm allowed to do a lot of work from home, but I must do it in Canvas, for instance, versus Blackboard. Um, I must try to have disability accessibility. I must have objectives. And so they are controlling how I do my job, and that's a normal employer-employer relationship. I'm not trying to criticize them for that. But that means workers' comp would usually apply to me versus then an independent contractor where it wouldn't usually apply to them. <laughs> Other factors in determining whether somebody is an employee or an independent contractor, um, do you have your own business? I do have my own business, but it's separate from the school, and they know about it. Um, whether you have a separate office, I do have a separate office, but that's for a separate business. Whose tools are being used? So I do have a work computer and I use that. How long is employment for? My employment's for a year contract, like it's hopefully renewed every year. And whether an employer is billed. I don't bill Southwestern College, so I'm probably an employee and not an independent contractor. All right. Occupational Safety and Health Act, OSHA, and this applies to almost all private employers. And the concept is simple. Employees are entitled to a safe and non-hazardous working environment, typically. All right, immigration. Um, so, in general, it's typically immigration laws want prospective workers to be permanent. There's specific special rules for temporary workers. And that's it for employment for this chapter.